right, so good evening, everybody. Um, I assume most people here are from Sweden because, well, that's kind of what the user group's called. Ah, oh, yes, hold, hold on a moment. What important thing first? One. Yay. Yeah. You can all go home now. We've seen the cat. Yes, I, my, my faithful assistant is here. Um, and they will now be leaving because she didn't like that. All right. So good evening, everybody. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name's Gail Shaw, um, MVP from South Africa, <clears throat> who got persuaded to do a presentation to the other end of the world because I asked, um, I said I hadn't done enough user group presentations this year. I promptly had about eight user groups posed that please would you, but I didn't have that many months left of the year. So tonight I'm going to talk to you about intelligent query processing. Um, I know this is a two hour session. This is not going to go two hours unless there's some really interesting questions. Last time I did this, it ran about an hour 15. I have added more content, but at the same time, this isn't a live audience and remote presentations tend to be a little less interactive because well, I can't I, I can't just pick people out of the audience to ask them questions. So I'll be talking about intelligent query processing. This is a SQL 2017-2019 feature set. Let's get straight into it, because why not? So there are some problems that we've had in SQL Server over the past, well, forever, that are caused by the execution model that SQL Server has. And anyone that's worked with performance tuning, anyone that's worked with ba um, badly performing queries probably knows one or more of these because they come up again and again and again. So the first one is that incorrect row estimations cause bad performance. This one is sometimes called bad parameter sniffing. This is also this also, uh, yeah, so this one's basically bad parameter sniffing, mostly. What happens here is that the optimizer estimates how many rows a piece of the query will affect, and it gets it right for the first execution, it gets it wrong for later ones. Bad parameter sniffing um, at, its, at its core. The second problem is that multi statement table valued functions and table variables cause bad performance. If anybody's ever gone whole hog into the multi-statement table function route for writing their systems, they might have encountered this slightly adverse behavior. Um, I had a client a few years ago. This would be the first and only client that I've actually told, sorry, I can't fix your problems. <clears throat> they called me in. This is a financial institute that shall remain unnamed. They called me in because they were having a problem with their month end process. Their month end process was taking three and a half days and was maxing out a 64 core server CPU for three and a half days. And I do. I do mean maxing out the CPU was sitting in the 85, 90, 95 range for three and a half days. They had a they, now this is this is slightly problematic because they really wanted to expand their business. But I mean, month end only can, can only take so long. They had like four days to do month end process. It was taking three and a half. There isn't much room there to expand your business. So I went in there nice and optimistic. I said, yes, um, this is the kind of thing I do. Let me have a look at this. Uh, the first indication of a problem was when I opened a store procedure and found two and a half thousand lines of code. There also was not a single table referenced in any of those queries. Every single object in the from clause of those queries had brackets, multi statement functions. I then opened one of those multi statement functions to see you know, how easily this could be unrolled and found a 5,000 line long function, which called other functions and put their results into table variables and passed them to other functions. <laughs> And I see some people are trying to hide from this problem. It was an entertaining problem. It was 10 levels deep before I found a table. Um, to say this performed badly, well, is an understatement. Um, after two days of analysis, I went to the manager and said, I have a solution for you. And he said, oh, yes, please do tell. 
To which I replied, nuke it from orbit and rewrite the whole thing. He was not impressed. Uh, I should also point out that their TempDB grew to 10 times the size of their user database every month end. Multi-statement table functions can cause problems. Table variables are also known to do it. Number three, inadequate memory estimations cause bad performance. Anyone's played with um, execution plans may be familiar with the spill to tempdb um, complaint. We spilled this eight times to tempdb. This is not a good idea because we use memory because disk is slow. So using disk to pretend to be memory, but never mind. That's a really bad idea. So memory estimations. If SQL gets the memory estimations wrong, all sorts of hell follows. And lastly, scalar functions cause bad performance. Um, if you think I've got something against functions, no, I'm quite happy with inline table value functions. They're fantastic. The other two could please go and die in a corner. Um, I refer to scalar functions as developer pit traps because the developers love them but don't realize how bad they are. <clears throat> um, I did some tests on scalar functions for a blog post a couple of years ago. Wrote, I just took a simple scalar function which did an aggregation of one table and dumped it into my select statement and thought, yeah, this, this should be decent. Um, I ran the query with that expression inlined and it ran in oh, 15 seconds or so. So cool, okay, um, that's fine. Let me just run, run this and run the front one with the function, run them each 25 times, use um, extended events to see how long they'll take, hit F5, went to get supper, came back, and found that the function had run twice. I still had 23 more executions to go. I went to, um, I played a game, went to bed, and came back the next morning to find it had just about finished. The scale, the, the equivalent query without the function ran in 25 executions in about three minutes. With the function, ran 16 hours. Scalar functions are a slightly performance problem, slight performance problems. Now, these are not surprises to the, to the SQL development team. These guys are really smart. They know this. Sorry, loud crashing noise behind me. And since there's only me and the cat in the house, that means one thing. Someone's. Um, so this, the, none of these are a surprise to the SQL Server development team. They're all very well aware of how SQL Server runs and <clears throat> what the problems are. But a lot of these have been inherent in the execution model. And it's only in the recent versions of SQL Server that we've had any opportunity to improve these. Now, these problems all come about because until SQL 2017, the optimized execute process was linear. The query was optimized, the query was executed. If the query execution engine found that the row estimations were off, it had absolutely no recourse. Row the execution plan comes in with one row estimated and the query execution engine is still sitting there a million rows later going, uh, one row? It, there's nothing it can do. It cannot throw that plan back as invalid because the only things which invalidate a plan are statistics changes and schema changes. And even then, the recompile happens before execution starts. At best, the plan is pulled from cache, validated, and that validation process fails. And so the plan goes back for a recompile. But once execution starts, that's it. That plan is fixed, that plan will be executed. Even it is, if it is absolute, bloody garbage. And so the problems we had that led to these performance problems, with possible exception of scalar functions, because they're a slightly off different one, was because at optimization time, we estimate the number of rows, we choose the joins, and we estimate how much memory will be required for this query to execute. And then they are executed. The execution engine requests that memory and executes that plan. Prior to SQL 2017, if it figured out that that requested memory was not enough, too bad. It requested what was estimated. End of story. Now, I should note there's actually a point in the middle here where the plan goes into cache. If the plan is pulled out of cache, the memory estimates and row estimations are the same as when it was compiled. 
And if it's executed and those are wrong, eh, sorry, nothing we can do about it. Classic, classic bad parameter sniffing problems that should probably be very familiar to anyone that's worked with performance tuning because this is a very common problem that's been around for decades. Single 2017, whoops, sorry, um, let me just fix that. Right, you did not see the previous version of the slide. Um, because apparently off by one errors are not solely the domain of front end developers. <clears throat> so 2017 and 2019 have introduced four solutions for these four problems. Three of these are were introduced in SQL 2017. One of them was introduced in 2019 and there's been some improvements. So I'll talk about them individually and I'll talk about how they've changed. The first one under the intelligent query processing banner is called adaptive joins. This is there to solve the problem of the join choice being very dependent on the estimated row count and the, opt and the execution engine having no recourse if the row count is wrong. The second one, interleaved execution, is a solution or partial solution at least for multi-statement table valued user-defined functions. We also have something called memory grant feedback, which was the solution introduced to solve the not enough too much memory granted problem. And finally, in SQL 2019, we got inline scalar functions. Let's see about these. One at a time, let's have a look at what these things do. So first up, adaptive joins. Normally, when the optimizer generates an execution plan, the join type is chosen at compile time. That is a loop join, a merge join, or a hash join. Which one is chosen is based upon how many rows and a bunch of other properties about the data. But how many rows is one of the main indicators. For small numbers of rows, you often get a loop join. For large numbers of rows, you get a hash join. For something in the middle, you sometimes get a merge join, or sometimes don't. And one's really dependent. But that decision was made by the optimizer. With adaptive joins, what instead happens is that the optimizer puts in an operator called adaptive join into the plan and defers the choice of join type to the query execution engine. The optimizer does not decide what type of join to use. The query execution engine decides what type of join to use. So what happens here is the join type is not defined until the first input has been read entirely. If that first input is returns a small number of rows, then a loop join is used. If that first input returns a large number of rows, a hash join is used. I should point out this is not as efficient as the optimal type of join always, because we still have to do some caching. We've got to read the first input, put it in a, in a memory structure of some form and then decide the join type. So it's not as efficient as a loop join or a hash join by themselves, but the advantage is it can change from one execution to another. So if you look at the execution plan, this is what you'll see as an adaptive join. It's a join with three inputs, which by the way, we've never seen before, because joins have always been two inputs. You join table A to table B, we take the result of that and join it to table C. Until now, joins have always had two inputs. And things like concatenation can have more, but joins can't. The adaptive join, however, has three inputs. The first one at the top is that first input. That one gets read and is used to determine what the other two, which of the other two paths will be used. Now, this is not three execution paths. This is two execution paths chosen from three. The first one's always used, as I said, that's the first input. Based on the number of rows, the second or third is then executed. In this case, if you look at the second input, a clustered index scan with a filter, that's your hash join. That will be the input for the hash join. 
So that will be in executed if there's a large number of rows coming out of this fact order scan. The bottom one, the index seek, that's the S, the outer part of a, sorry, the inner table of a nested loop join. So this will be executed if the number of rows coming out of that top input is small, the adaptive join executes a loop join using the bottom input. If you look at an actual execution plan, one of those two inputs will have a row count above zero. The other one will always be zero. You never will have both of these executed. It's always one or the other. Now, one caveat, you might notice the top input here is a column store index scan. That has to be a column store index scan because one of the requirements for adaptive joins is that we are executing in batch mode. Now, this is not actually a huge problem in 2019, but in 2017 it was. Because in SQL 2017, batch mode was limited to column store indexes. No column store, no batch mode, no adaptive joins. 20, one of 2019's enhancements is batch mode for row store indexes. So under some circumstances, queries against row store indexes can run in batch mode, which means you can get your adaptive joins. You'll still see these more commonly with column stores because they will always run in batch mode. Uh, the second requirement is that the query can be executed with an indexed nested loop or with a hash join. This means there must be an index on that inner table supporting that join, because if there isn't, this will not be chosen. The join must be executable with a hash join. That means an equality, not an inequality, not a bit, not a like, not a between, not a some other weird type of join. The join must be an equality because only equality joins can be executed with hash joins. So let me rephrase that. A hash join has to contain an equality. It can contain other stuff, but it has to contain an equality. So if you're joining on a greater than or equal to B, you will not be seeing an adaptive join. End of story, because it can't execute with a hash join. And the last requirement is the plan shape for the two joins must be identical. So if we chose a, a loop join, it must be simply a seek operation. And if we chose a hash join, it must simply be a scan with a filter. We must, there's no key lookups, there's no other weird stuff. We can always execute this very cleanly with the same plan shape. So that's another main requirement. Uh, the join type changes, other stuff can't. So we can't have aggregations pushed down under the join for hash joins, but above for loops, not doesn't work like that. They have to be the same plan shape. Generally, you're going to find that this works for very simple queries and not for complex ones. Um, when I've done demo work, demos for this, the simpler the query, the better. Simple queries, I can get to go to adaptive joins. More complex ones typically will fall back to hash joins or loop joins and just completely resist going adaptive full stop. Let me find my query window and show you an adaptive join. Okay, so I've got a database here called Interstellar Transport because I got very bored of wide world shipping or whatever Microsoft calls their latest demo database. And the less said about adventure works, the better. So I've got here a simple procedure that joins a column store table, my shipments table with my shipment details table and filters it by client. A, a really, really, really simple little query this is one that could have some bad premise sniffing problems though. If I filter for a client that's only ever shipped one thing, I should get a loop join. If I filter for a client that ships a, a million items a day, I'm going to get billions of rows and I probably want a very different plan shape. If I run this, I only have 746 rows. This is not actually a very big database at the moment. If I go to the execution plan, you can actually see that I've got an adaptive join here. So I've got my column store index scan on my shipments table. This could have a filter in it, uh, but obviously column stores can't have seek operations on. So this does have a filter. This is a filtered view of my shipments table filtering by client. Then dependent on how many rows came out of this, I get one of these two paths. 
I can get index scan on shipment details. That obviously will go, that goes into a hash join, or I can get an index seek on shipment details. This goes into the loop join. Looking at the costs and the row counts, you can actually see which of these paths was taken. This one, while it's got a cost of 100%, it has zero seconds and zero rows. It estimated a bunch of rows, but none were executed. This one, however, cost 66% of the query. I'll get to that in a moment. Um, returned 746 of 369 rows and took 202% of the time. Um, that's actual versus estimated. That's why this gets a little weird. But you can see that this one executed because I've got data that came out of this path. If I found a client that had billions of rows, this one would execute. I don't actually think I have any. Um, let you see what I've got. It'll be shipments column store. And order buy would have been useful as well. Oh, that that looks pretty decent. That might get me a loop, a hash join. Let's have a look. Note, I have not cleared this plan from cache. This is exactly the same cached plan. Let's see if we can get a different join type. We've got a different join type. This one has joined and apparently spilt data to TempDB as well. Whoops, memory estimations are off. That's a later demo. But this time you can see that this index, that this portion of the join ran. I had my scan on shipment details. 914,000 rows were returned. This was too much data to do a loop join and so we've had a hash join. Now, I just want to show you how this goes on older versions of SQL. So let's switch my compat bow back to 130 and find my join query again. 56 and the other one is 64, I think it was. I have to switch to compatibility mode back because these are gated behind the compatibility modes. So you're not going to see adaptive joins in the compact mode older than 140, 140 being SQL 2017. Uh, this is a 2019 instance, just to be clear. So that's what I get in SQL 2016 compact mode. It's decided that a loop join is good, which we knew because we saw that. We've got our index seek, and if I now switch to the larger query, this should hurt. Not too bad, but it's only 187,000 rows. I've got exactly the same plan, and now my loop join has executed. Oh, let's see, how many times did it execute? Oh, the loop join executed once, that was useful. The, the seek executed da, 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 112,096 times for an estimated number of executions of 230. Not a good idea. So this is what you get on the older versions of SQL Server. I bump this back to 150, 2019, and I'll again get the, actually let me leave it there. I should still get the, sorry, that's my um, DDL trigger firing. I still have my adaptive join. So you can see the difference between the compatibility modes for 2017, well, 2019 actually, and then the earlier version of 2016. Okay. Questions on adaptive joins? No questions right now. Oh dear, I always worry about no questions. I mean, <laughs> I, mean I, I'm happy to talk for an hour and a half, but. This, this is the Nordics. It's a common phenomenon for speakers to, to be like, no questions, really? Uh, but it, it's quite I have common. A, Ooh. I, 
I have a comment, not a question. This is for everyone. Kids, when you upgrade SQL Server, change the compatibility mode of your databases because otherwise you won't get any of the cool and new stuff that Gail is showing. Um, slightly. So you get a lot of the new features. Um, for example, I'm trying to think what was actually new in 2019 that's not gated behind a compat mode. Um, if I go back to the earlier versions of SQL Server, when column stores were introduced in, what, 2012, you could get a column store even on compat mode 20, 2008, because it was a brand new feature. But this is a behavioral change, and behavioral changes to existing queries are always gated behind the compat mode. Um, so you can get brand new features. Oh, the format function, for example. Uh, not that that's a good function, but that one works even on older compat modes, but as I said, behavioral changes, which all of these things are, the intelligent query processing things are always behind uh, your compact mode changes. And on that point, please test your upgrades before you do them. Your users don't like testing performance in production, I promise. Uh, I love the work, but uh, your users typically don't. <laughs> anyway, so that was adaptive joins. That's probably one of the easiest of these. This just works. Once you're up on 2017, 2019 compact mode, this works, and a lot, a lot, not all, of your bad parameter sniffing problems go away. It, not, it is not all of them. There are a lot of ways to have bad parameter sniffing that are not fixed with adaptive joints. But small, small fixes at a time, it's better than we've ever had. Okay, so on to the second one. And this is actually a two for one. Interleaved execution and deferred compilation. Because they do very much the same thing, and they do it very much the same way. Slight, slight differences. So if you remember back to the beginning, I talked about how the optimize execute pipeline works, and it's always optimize, then execute. That optimize is a batch level optimization. So that is your entire store procedure or your entire batch of ad hoc code. The entire thing is optimized, then the entire thing is executed. Now, this gives you an interesting problem when it comes to table variables because they do not exist before the batch started. By definition, they're batch scoped. So how many rows does a table variable have when it doesn't exist? This is not a tree falls in a forest type question. It actually has a defined answer. And that defined answer is 100, because that's the only estimation that could possibly be made. How many rows from this table variable? We don't know. It doesn't exist. It certainly hasn't been populated. 100. Prior to SQL 2014, that estimation was one, which was horrible. Uh, 100 isn't much better, but I mean, what's the query, what's the query optimization team going to do? The answer is deferred compilation. There's a similar problem with multi-statement table valued functions. Because your multi-statement table valued user defined functions, which get a price for their name, and their performance problems. You see, normally what happens is the query gets optimized. The optimizer looks at this and says, there's a, there's a call to a function in here. Black box, what does this cost at? It costs zero because we don't know what's in this function. That function is a separate batch that has to get called, that has to get optimized and executed by itself. The outer query that references that function does not know what that function costs. And just to switch back to Management Studio for a moment, that joins are done, interleaved execution. Let me switch back to my compatibility mode again. Easy for me if I do this. Yeah. All right, so we are on compat mode 130. And no, that's not, you should not, not supposed to be seeing that. Whoops, don't look at that. No, you didn't see that. This has a scalar function, it's called shipment totals. If I run this and look at the execution plan, I have a 100 row estimation on my table variable. Because what's happened here is the multi-statement table valued function has run it's inserted its results into that table variable, and that table variable is getting used in my query. Now, interestingly enough, this is costed at one, at one percent. This isn't the costing of the function. 
This is a costing of the scan of the table variable. What did that function cost? I don't know. Doesn't appear in this query. Now that problem hasn't been solved. The function is still a black box to the outer query. But what happens now in SQL 2017 and above is in some cases where there is a multi-statement table valued function in a query, the execution is interleaved. Instead of the whole batch getting optimized and executed in one go, that is the query and the function that it contains, the function is executed. Its results are put into a table variable. Then we send the query back to the query optimizer for compilation. The query didn't get compiled. The function executed first. Then the query that contained the function got optimized, at which point we know how many rows are in that table variable. We've run the function. We've looked at it. It has you know, 372 because we can see it on disk, uh, in memory, wherever it is. Then the outer query gets optimized. That means we don't have this 100 row table variable row estimation any longer for a function because we know exactly how many rows are in this function or how many rows were returned by this function. This isn't perfect. It's still prone to caching problems because how many rows re the function returned is dependent on the first execution. If that's an atypical number, you're going to get bad parameter sniffing problems. Hopefully you get adaptive joins, but maybe you're maybe not. Um, so this is by no means perfect. It is a hell of a lot better, especially if you've got a function that consistently returns a similar number of rows. I mean, if a function returns 72 rows, the 100 row estimation is fine. 120, yeah, pretty good. 10,000, eh, no. What about a, a multi-statement function that returns 1.2 million rows every time it executes? Well, that 100 row row estimation is so far off, it may as well not be there. But with more interleaved execution, can you sort of split the execution of the two things apart? The query that contains a function could be optimized based on exactly how many rows are really in that function, not how not the have row estimation. So that's the first part, interleaved execution. This is a 2017 feature. 2019 went one step further and added something called deferred compilation. Now, this has always been a feature for temp tables. When you reference a temp table in a query, the first time that a query runs, its compilation is deferred because the temp table doesn't exist. Table variables never did that. So table variables were just optimized happily because we can work out what the table definition looks like. We don't know what's in it, but yeah, okay, it's good enough. But now on um, 2019, we've got deferred compilation on table variables as well. So if a query references a table variable, that query does not compile until the table variable exists and has been populated, at which point the query goes back to the optimizer for an optimization based on how many rows are in that table variable and we carry on executing. Again, this is not perfect. This is a good step, but it's very prone to bad parameter sniffing if you've got table variables or functions which return atypical numbers of rows. So, there's really not very much to see in the execution plan because what you get is table valued function. It doesn't actually look very interesting. So this was on compact mode 130. We had a row estimation of 100 rows. But if you look at how many rows came out of this, it was not 100 rows. So let's switch this up to a decent compact mode again. And run this again. And there's my table function. Right, that's actually go double check that. Right. Switch back. Yep, shipment total is my function. So under compact mode 130, I do get my table function showing up here. 
with a no row estimate. Zero, yeah. Um, and then there's my actual data from this function. This is a placeholder. This says that the function executed, but there's actually nothing really there. This is the data from that function, this, this table variable, and we had the 100 row estimate. So I switch back to 150 and run this again. So this is still here. It's still not really, it's a reference that there's a function. If I look, go look at my table here though, estimated number of rows, 26,268. It's not 100 anymore. How many rows actually came out of this? 26,268. We got this exactly correct because we optimized, we executed function before we optimized the query. Now, this is not again perfect. If I go change this to, it was 64 that had a really high number of things. My table variable my function results is now estimated 26,268 actual oh, she's exactly the same um that's probably because it's a scan yeah oh yeah it's a, it's an unfiltered scan eh, oh well change that let's see if i can get some different behavior this time I have to play a bit more with this to try and get this to behave itself. Yeah, here we go. So and this actually did recompile as well. Um, so we've got an estimated number of rows of two, 2,600 and an actual 2,600. So this time it's actually managed to get that correct every time. It won't always, because this does generally cache the plan. Um, I've got an ad hoc query here, so the query's, the query's getting recompiled every time it runs, which is why you're seeing the correct numbers of rows. If this was a store procedure that was caching plans, you wouldn't see this kind of behavior. So that's adaptive, so that's interleaved execution. Mostly. So requirements and limitations, read only statements. If you've got a function in an update, an insert or a delete, too bad. It's not going to get this behavior. You can't insert through functions, but if you've got it in a statement that is not a select, this one will be applied. Now, the documentation states that this cannot be used on the inside of a cross apply. The documentation is actually wrong. The, the caveat's actually a little bit more interesting. So what I've got here is a straight is a straightforward numbers table, and I'm doing a cross apply. And this, I've definitely got an interleaved execution because I've got an estimated number of rows of nine. That's actually probably a bad idea. And an estimated number of rows of a thousand. Yeah, that's that's definitely off. Something's broken. Oh no. I think I have a thousand row limit. Yeah, got some funds. No, it has actually pulled a thousand rows out. So this is doing the interleaved execution. It's also very definitely on the right-hand side of a cross-apply, on the inside of a cross-apply. So let me try that again. The number of executions must be deterministic and optimized, sorry, determinable in optimization time and deterministic. It's got nothing to do with it on, being on a cross-apply. The requirement is that we must be able to figure out how many times this function is going to run at optimization time. So if I did this, that would no longer be a true statement because this is not going to run a deterministic number of times. This is going to run as many times as there are rows in that table. 
This will not give us interleaved execution. And we are back indeed to our 100 rows estimation because there was absolutely no way to tell how many times this would run and so we did not get our interleaved execution. Any time that you can determine, or should I say the optimizer can determine how many times that function will run in a particular query, it can use interleaved execution. In this case, by the way, it was 33 times. It doesn't have to run once. It has to be a deterministic number. This function ran 33 times, which means before this query ran, this function was run 33 times. And put in cache. At least I think it's that, that's how it works. I'd have to dig into the internals to be entirely sure. But those are your requirements. Must be read only, and the number of executions must be deterministic and, and determinable at optimization time. So that's your interleaved execution. This one, to be honest, it's nice. It doesn't always fix the serious problems that we have with table variables and multi statement functions. It makes them better. But of the intelligent query processing, I'd say this is probably one of the least powerful of them. It certainly does help a lot though. So do we have any questions on interleaved execution? None so far. Oh boy. Somebody please I'm, ask. I'm guessing that because you hard coded the parameters to the query, they'll it'll probably only run once and then be cross joined. That's my guess. Yeah, my guess it probably will. But if I put a parameter in there, then it's not going to apply for an interleaved execution at all because it won't be deterministic. Mm. Um, so you should probably I can't... be able to see it if you if you set statistics I/O or something. Um, I probably have to fire up uh, extended events and. A module in because this doesn't have any data generation in here. This is just purely generated rows in there. Yeah, yeah these things are annoyingly hard to see. <laughs> it's very hard to trace down what these are actually doing. Um, by the way, that's actually an interesting one for anybody that's using lots of user defined functions, whether they be scalar or multi function. Just out of sheer entertainment, sometime go fire up extended events and capture the module start module end and see just how many times these functions actually run because it's kind of scary because it's not once they'll often run a lot of times and you don't see that i had a client who had a recursive scalar function as a table um, as a computer column in a table that referenced that same table recursively um, that was a mess <laughs> <laughs> I could Select use a few star other... from a, a table with 4,000 rows took 16 seconds. Um, I rewrote it as a recursive common table expression. It ran for like four milliseconds. <clears throat> so, but I mean, they're developers. They don't. I'm I'm a developer, but they they were not database developers. So, who can fault them, right? Um. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, by the way, that particular I, client that had the nested recursive, uh, the nested multi-statement functions, I asked them once why the hell they went this design route. I didn't quite phrase it that bluntly because I, I mean, I'm in a meeting with client, and the the vendor actually had the audacity to tell me to my face, at the time we wrote the system, which by the way was in about 20, 2000, I guess 2011, 2012, there was no guidance on whether to Say functions were bad or not. Which I'm oh. like, oh, I wrote some back in 2008. Would you like me to show it to you? That's so sweet. <laughs> says, I can pull up an article I wrote two years before that that shows you how bad they are. <clears throat> I actually wrote the documentation. No. <laughs> oh, I, I, actually, I, I have actually had that once. I can't remember where the conversation was. Probably Twitter. Um, somebody says you clearly haven't read section two of this. The, this particular article that we're discussing, <laughs> which I replied, I wrote it. <laughs> I admittedly haven't read it for a couple of years, but I did write it. <laughs> yeah, for, he was also for, spectacularly wrong. For questions, Gabe, I was going to ask about the cross supplier, but you touched on it, so I don't need to. So. Yeah. <laughs> to be honest, it's not common for you to see this 
style of a cross apply because it's a little on the what the odd side. I mean, why would why? I could just cross join it at that point. Yeah, I mean to force um, a loop join. That's that's why I use cross applies basically. Well, cross join should loop as well. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. It'll be interesting to see because it's different execution. No. I suspect the optimizer looks at this and goes, you idiot. <laughs> I have seen a case, though, where replacing the apply with a join actually turned a 13-hour query into a 20-minute query. Hmm. I mean, if it's not correlated, it's, it's more or less a constant, yeah. although it's a table. So. My, my liability insurance only covers so much, so let's move on with this. <laughs> <laughs> There's a reason I don't give names when I'm talking about the disasters I've seen. <laughs> All right, on to one of the more interesting ones, memory grant feedback. Now, this is interesting because this is one of the few that actually be, um, operate across multiple executions. The previous two we've seen operate inside a single query execution. It may be broken into two pieces like the interleaved execution, but we're still talking about one query. Memory grant feedback, however, doesn't. So, memory grants. When a query needs some piece of memory to do its job, that memory, the memory required is estimated by the query optimizer. This will be a function of the size of the rows, the size of the number of rows, and a few other things. That query, when it executes, must get that memory grant before it can start executing. And this is a really complicated subject, by the way. Uh, there are multiple gates for queries to wait at, depending on how much memory they want. And there's only so much workspace memory available. This isn't the buffer pool we're talking about. This is a portion of SQL's memory that is not the buffer pool, that is not the planned cache, that is not any of the other 10 million caches it has, that is there for queries to use to execute. You do not want a query asking for two gigs of memory. It's never going to execute because that memory is never available. And if anyone's ever had resource semaphore weights, you've run into this because a resource semaphore weight is a weight for the memory to be granted to the query before it can execute. And this is starting to execute. It doesn't ask for the memory when it needs it, it asks right at the beginning. So if the query requests more memory than it needs, it's hogging resources and it's preventing other queries from running because those other queries are going to get resource semaphore weights and have to sit and wait until this, this one's finished. Queries that request too little memory, on the other hand, spill to TempDB because you cannot, during the execution of the query, request more memory. You wanted 100 megs, you've got 100 megs. You now need realize you need 500, too bad, deal with it. We deal with it by spilling to TempDB, potentially multiple times. Absolutely love thrashing my disks um, as we spill to TempDB. Does anyone put TempDB on fast SSDs? Yes? Uh, no. All right, both of these are bad. They're just bad in different ways. The first one limits concurrency. The queries requested too much memory, so other queries can't run. The second one, you're increasing the I.O. load. The query slows down because it's waiting for I.O. back and forth, back and forth to TempDB. What happens with memory grant feedback is the first query that runs that has a memory grant insufficient or too, too much or too little, doesn't matter, nothing happens. So the first time my query runs, it requested 10 megs, it got 10 megs, it needed 200. It suffered. It's built to TempDB repeatedly. At the end of that query execution, however, there's a note put into the plan in cache for that query, basically saying 200 megs actual. 10 megs was the estimate, 200 megs was what was needed. The next time that query runs, the amount that it needed last time is what's used for the memory estimate. So now this query requests 200 megs of memory, gets 200 megs, executes, no spills to TempDB. This is saved in the plan cache with the query plan. Note, it's only saved in the plan cache. 
when this plan is removed from cache, goodbye to all the memory feedback history. Gone. Toast. Next time it executes, we get the whole little dance again. Also note that it's always looking at how much memory the previous execution needed. There are some very pathological cases that you can generate where every single time the query runs, it gets the wrong amount of memory because it's always looking at the previous execution. And those, by the way, are horrible, but fortunately, these, the query, this SQL dev team are actually quite smart and they put a limit on this. A query will bounce, I think it's 30 times, at which point, nope, we're not, we're not adjusting the memory ever again. It gets whatever it got the last execution, good or bad. So there are some limits to how much it will adjust. But what you can typically see with this is the first time you execute it, you get the warning. We, ref, we did not have enough memory in this case, we use tempdb to spill data, spill level eight and one spilt thread. That hurts, by the way. That's eight different spills to tempdb. Um, not sp it didn't spill eight things, it spilled eight times. That's really bad. The second execution, however, there's no tempdb spill at all. So look at this one. And let me first start with compat mode 130. And my query here. So, this is, uh, come on, what's wrong with this? All right, so that's my, my query. Um, this is not a well written query. I mean, I'm forcing a hash join firstly. I'm doing a really weird filter. This is a piece of code which is written to cause this problem. Please do not run this kind of thing. This is not, a, this is for demo purposes, do not use in production. And we got way too much memory. The request was for 84 megs. The grant was for 84 megs. We used three. Yep, same problem. Not going to change because this is compact mode for 160. So this is compact mode 130 equal 2016. So memory grants are wrong. Memory grants are wrong. Too bad the memory grants are wrong. And you live with this. So I think there was on 2016 and earlier, there was virtually no way to fix this kind of problem. I mean, Adam Mechanic had some really interesting um, tricks to fool the optimizer into more or less memory, but my goodness, were they tricks. Like cross applies to horrible sets that actually return no rows, but looked really horrible to the optimizer. Um, yeah, it would generate, it would look at this mess and generate something like a, a couple hundred megs of memory grad, but this particular thing returned no rows, it actually needed no memory. It was solely used to trick the optimizer into more memory. Horrible tricks, but anyway, let's go back to 150 and see if my demo works. This is the one I always have the biggest amount of trouble with because it's very dependent on data. So first execution, again, memory grant 84 megs, used 3.3, woohoo, all right. My warning has gone away. Memory grant, 18 megs. Now that's still high. I mean, it needed 3.3, .3, but it's a hell of a lot better than 84. And yeah, this is going to stay there. It's going to request that 18 megs every time now. It's getting late. So, plan gone from memory. Guess what? We're back with the 84 meg memory grant. Second execution. 18. All right. This is not, um, it's now going to need a lot more memory. And you can see that not on the select, by the way. The warnings are elsewhere. So my hash match, 
Spilled data during execution with spill level one and four spilled threads. We wrote 3,228 pages to DebDB. Whoops. That's a lot of data. The hash match aggregate also spilled to DebDB. It spilled at spill level one with four spilled threads and it wrote 2,266 pages to DebDB. Eek. My DebDB is probably crying right about now. The hash match has no warning. The hash match did not spill the second time. The hash match got enough memory. We now have a memory grant of 70 megs, 71, 80 actually. Yep, nope, 71. Your second okay. hash match still has a warning. The second hash match still has a warning. No, it doesn't. Ooh. And we now have a memory grant of 115 megs. So we went from 18 to 71 to 115 as we figured out that various things were spilling. And it's going to stay here, by the way. I can run this another 10 times. This memory grant will now stay because it's now stable. It's not spilling. It's not over requesting. So this is now stable. I clear this plan from memory. You'll be doing exactly the same again. Um, if I go and request zero again, we're going to have a memory grant of 115 megs. We we're going to need three. So we're now going to adjust our memory grant down. Yeah. This is the logical case I was talking about where one parameter value needs a very little memory, one needs a lot, and you oscillate between the two. The, the memory grant feedback will always be one execution behind, sometimes two executions behind. So, ow, that hurt. Yep, two spills, two seconds. One spill, one second. zero spills and zero seconds. I mean, this is a single user machine and you see the differences. Right, so what can you do if you've got that kind of pathological situation where you're getting memory oscillation? The general solution here is split it into two stored procs and run them as different procs. Have some way, if, if I was doing this in production, I would have a master proc that looked and said, uh, if it's zero, run this one. If it's three, run that one. If it's two, that one, and one, that one as well. I've tested this out and know what's working. Because otherwise, this is going to hurt like hell. So let's actually see how bad I can make this. Um, it does stop at some point. I just don't know where. At some point, it's going to stop. I think it does take 30 odd executions before it actually stops adapting. Yeah, that's still adapting. I did test this out at some point. Yeah, at one point I had a piece of code that literally just bounced between them to see to see how, just how bad I could make it. I think it's 30 ish executions. Um, let me actually see if I wrote this somewhere. Yes, I did. Memory guard feedback and data skew, naturally. So it's 32 executions. So if it's executed 32 times and the memory grant is not stable, the adaption stops and whatever was granted the last time is what it gets. If that's terrible, sorry, it's what you get. Kind of luck of the draw. You could get a high or low memory grant. Yeah. Uh, let me dump this. So there's the blog post. 
I do like this feature. I mean, I wrote the blog post. It sounded like I didn't like this feature, but it's actually not the case. I really do like this. It really solves a whole pile of problems that, frankly, were really hard to fix, short of Adam's code from hell. Um, I, I like Adam, but really his code, you, you would look at it and you go, I don't understand how that works, but I don't want to touch it ever again. All right, so that's roughly memory grant feedback. Um, so requirements, batch mode or SQL 2019. Because in 2017, this required batch mode. In 2019, that batch mode requirement was removed. If you look at my query, I am actually running column stores and I am in batch mode, but this is 2019. I could do it in row mode. Um, I just happen to have the column store indexes used for this demo. If you, this number, by the way, came from the dev team. I make no guarantees that it is still accurate. It's something that uh, Joseph, Joseph Sack gave me about three years ago, just after 2017 was launched. The threshold for when the memory graph feedback kicks in is if it's over or under allocated by 50%. This is not documented because the development team reserves the right to change this at any point to any other number that they see fit. Same with that 32 times ending adapt adaptation. At the time I wrote the blog post, it stopped adapting after 32 times. It is not a documented number. The development team reserves the right to change that at any point to any other number they feel like. Don't make any assumptions based on that number. It might even not be true in SQL 2019. I haven't tested it in quite a while. There are some extended events that you can use to track memory grant feedback. Um, Actually, this isn't just sorry. This isn't just uh, memory graph feedback. This is all of them. So uh, there's an extent. Actually, hold on. I'm going to move this that slide to the end because it's actually in the wrong place. Pretend I'm going to make a short interruption, Gail. Uh, oh. I need to thank you for the presentation, but I need to leave. So I'm I'm going to leave, oh. and I hope the meeting will continue, even though it's on my tenant. Uh, I think the <laughs> recording will continue, and I'll take care of it afterwards. But so far, it's been awesome. So thank you so much for coming. You're welcome. OK, let's see if we still have a meeting in a minute. <laughs> I'll, I'll uh, disconnect and then I'll see if the chat is going on. Otherwise, I'll just reconnect and fingers crossed and you know. <laughs> OK, cool. Cheers. OK, I think we still have a meeting. You're muted, Daniel. Newbie mistake. I have another 45 minutes, then I have to take off. It's okay, this is not going to take 45 <laughs> minutes. I'm in the last section. Cool. Yay, we still have a meeting. All right. So the last section, this is 2019 specific. The three previous ones have all worked since 2017, though they got improvements in 19. But inline scalar functions is a 2019 specific feature. So, Scalar functions are not inline. A lots of people believe they are, they're not. The scalar functions in SQL Server prior to SQL 2019 ran once for every row in the query that they were called in. This could be absolutely horrible. You, let me do some proving to you because a lot of people I tell them that and they go no 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 it's got to be in line I mean no way would Microsoft write something so stupid let's go and let's find my favorite extended bits so all right scalar function I want the module end because that's actually the one event, extended event function that will catch. So it's one extended event that will catch functions. I really don't need very much here. This will be fine. And there's nobody else running on this server, so I don't need any of those. This actually should be good. I don't need anything there either. Okay. So start that one and just watch live data. Okay. Let's switch back to an old compatibility mode because otherwise my demo is not going to work. I was wondering.
working earlier, and then I realised I was in compact mode um, 150, so of course it wasn't working. Right, so I've got a very simple function here. And off a date. I mean, how many of us have a function like that in our service? I'm guessing a lot of people, and I'm guessing it's on a lot of queries. Yeah, I'm about to give you some bad news. So, my transactions table has thirty-four thousand four hundred and thirty-one rows in it. Turn stats time on. I do not have an execution plan. Uh, I don't have no, execution plan off. Right, so 34,000 rows got the time trimmed off their date in 16 milliseconds with an elapsed time of 329. The elapsed time is mostly going to be display. That's the 34,000 rows coming back to my client and getting displayed because Management Studio is, for no reason we can figure out, really bad at displaying data fast. I mean, it's, it's not as if it's used for that very often or anything. I know, I know, I know. It's a really fast function. But I have 34,431 events. Who would have figured that number? One hundred and forty one milliseconds. Again, don't look at the elapsed time. That's going to be based on data display. This is the number we're interested in. I just went from 16 milliseconds to 141 milliseconds to do exactly the same thing, except one of them was in a function. Let me see if I can find a particularly nastier function. Look again. Functions, inline scalar functions 2019, yes, thank you. That one. Okay, this one is particularly utterly horrible. So, all right. So this one is a data accessing scalar function. If you thought that a non-data accessing scalar function was bad, oh boy. Query without the function. And the one with the function should just be much the same thing, except right. yep, that should. These should be equivalent because this subquery is this subquery. They will return the same thing. Okay. Oh, this is actually going to be fun. All right. So time and I/O stats going on this time. Um, let me clear 34,000 executions from my extended event. Right, so this is the one without the function, and it ran in yeah, pretty much instantly. Right, so it's nice and easy. So we read the shipments table, one scan, 254 reads. We read the shipment details table, 2,955 logical reads. And 203 milliseconds of CPU time. Again, this is going to be mostly display. Um, obviously, 200 milliseconds of CPU, 200-ish milliseconds of display. Sweet. Ah, thank you. Did I not create the function? 
I'm guessing I didn't create the function. Would it be useful to create functions if you're about to demo them? Okay, not quite time to get coffee. notice about this output. Firstly, 1.6 seconds. Secondly, where's my shipment details table? It's in a function, which means it's in another batch, which means that IOStats doesn't know about it, which means you are never going to see this if you're looking at IO stats to do your tuning. Does that affect the CPU stats as well? CPU is measuring start to finish and the function execution was during that. Okay. But the IO stats happened on another thread. Mm. Thread. Another uh, batch. It's in another scope, so it doesn't show up. Unfortunately, module end does not show me IO stats, which is a pity. But look at shipment. Wee. Wee. 34,431 times we went and read the shipment details table. I can make this worse. Because I'm pretty sure there's a good index on this table. I need the execution plan for that, don't I? No, it's doing a nice um, hash, it's doing a merge join and index scan. Oh, that's not too bad. I could definitely make this worse, though. Like that. Column store's got more data in it. A lot more data in it. Right, so I'm... Yeah, a lot more data in it. This is without the function. Okay, 15 seconds. Ow. Oh, execution plan's on. I shouldn't turn the execution plan on if I'm testing performance times. Uh, yep, two seconds without it. That also was data getting loaded into cache. you get when you put too much data into a table. Okay, cool. Um, so let's go back to the presentation. Okay, um, and I've, so actually I don't want to go back to the presentation, so let's just minimize that and leave it for a bit. It's executing now under compact mode. Um, sorry. Uh, sorry. Um, this thing decided it was going to do weird things. That's better. So that's running under compact mode 130. If I change the compact mode, it will not affect that thing's execution, or at least it shouldn't. Oh, yeah. Um, we're, yeah. We're seeing uh, your presenter view. Uh, we, we're not seeing the, the actual presentation. I have a feeling you're browsing different slides. I shouldn't actually be on a slide at all, so let me just kill the share and try again. I should be sharing screen one. So you should be seeing Management Studio. Yep, seeing Management Studio now. Um, so this is the function running, by the way, in that other query that I had. It's taking about minutes per execution. All right, 
right, I'm just going to switch to the compat mode because it shouldn't affect the running query. It should affect only new queries. So back to my scalar functions, these ones. Now I'm on compat mode 150. This should not have changed because this is in line. And 16 milliseconds, cool. Um, there is some kind of other work going on, on on this machine, which might be slowing things down. I mean, it's just a poor little desktop. But 16 milliseconds, okay, the elapsed time is dead. There we go. Automatically on SQL 2019, my scalar function was inlined. And if we go and look at the live data, you will note that there are no more calls to date only. It didn't actually run. It was inlined into the query, and so it is not a module end. Uh, filter by that value. I do not want that value. I want everything except that value. No sign of it. never ran. Well, that function never hit the module end event because it didn't run as a separate batch. It was during parsing, the contents of that function were inlined into my query and executed as a single query. So no more 34,000 executions of my function and huh, it's actually faster than the one with the data at. No, it's just a rounding errors on the CPU time. And this poor thing is still executing. That actually is going to probably execute for 20 odd minutes. So I think I'm just going to kill it. Yeah, that's still ticking up. I am now in compat mode 150 though. this runs, let me talk about limitations. This does not work for every function. That said, it will work for the majority of the functions you have. There are a long list of things that the function can do to be in light. I'm actually going to find this. It's quite an interesting list. I did up on it last night. Scalar function inlining in the Microsoft documentation. Right. Blah, blah, blah. So, inline scalar requirements. It can be inlined if all of the following conditions are true. All of the following. Declare set of fine, select of fine. If else is a fine, you can have branching logic. You can have nested or recursive function calls. It can still inline them. It must not invoke anything which is time dependent or has side effects. So get date is out. If you've got a function which invokes get date, it does not get inlined. End of story. New sequential ID, same problem. It may not reference table variables or table value parameters. So if you've got table variables that you're passing to your scalar function, no inlining for you. It may not reference a scalar UDF in its group by clause. Okay, or distinct, with, or distinct without an order by. It's not used in the order by. Blah, blah, blah. The interesting thing to note is this restriction added in CU2. This restriction added in CU4. This restriction added in CU5. They keep adding restrictions. I'm guessing as we're finding bugs in the inlining, there are additional restrictions getting added. So this is something which is in development still. It does work for the majority of queries, though, honestly. Um, you can't use XML methods. That's probably one that's going to catch. Uh, you can't use things like object ID. That might catch people. You can't use things like row count. Okay. This probably is one of the bigger ones. No CTEs. If you've got CTEs in your functions, they don't get in mind. 
subquery is a five, CTE is a lot. I won't entirely sure why. Anyway, this welcome to the documentation if you want to go and read in detail of what it is we've done. No, this is still going to be running. That said, no more executions. That function's not running, even though I'm running a query with a function. So the data accessing functions will in line fine. The other thing to note is that this will not make your query as fast as if you didn't have the inline, as if you didn't have the function. So going back to this, this one ran in something like 15 seconds, no, eight seconds. This will be slower, absolutely will be slower. How bad? What I was finding in my testing is it's probably about a quarter slower than without the function. So if you can go do without the user defined function, you're still going to be better off. But it's no longer so absolutely horrible as to bring a server to its knees, which it certainly could in the past. That said, I have a feeling that there's still not going to be in line some of the 2000 line long scalar functions I've seen in the past. There are limits after all. And that is my I think that killed my sharing. So there's a documentation if anybody wants to go and read up on it. Okay, so extended events to monitor this stuff. Most of these do have scalar fun of extended events. Um, there's an extended event on adaptive joins called adaptive join skipped. I could not make that thing fire ever. Even when a query that I knew could be adaptive wasn't, it didn't fire. So, yeah, I put that down as that's that's nice, but I don't know why it's there. It's it's either bugged when I tested it, or it was looking for something I wasn't finding. Anyway, it's there if you really want to go and look, but really, I don't know. Um, interleaved exec disabled reason. If a situation occurs where interleaved execution should occur but doesn't, that extended event fires with reasons as to why. So this is useful if you want to try and figure out why you're not getting into lead execution with your uh, multi-statement functions. There are actually multiple extended events for the memory grant, but the two I found really useful were memory grant updated by feedback. That is a case where the query executed ended, the memory grant was substantially different from what it started with, or memory it needed was substantially different from what it started requesting. Um, so this event fires when the plan is updated with the memory. And then spilling reports from memory grant feedback. Um, I can't actually remember exactly when that fires, but again, it's going to tell you stuff about when memory grants uh, occur or memory grant feedback occurs. And I don't think there's any extended events for the scalar function in learning. You can use module end if you want to track when you don't have it, but I'm not sure there's anything that tracks when you do have it. Uh, there may have been some added. I haven't actually dug through extended events recently. <coughs> so, that is it for my presentation. This poor query is still running. Oh dear. That's probably I would, gonna I would love to see the two query plans for for um, your your manual query and the interleaved one. Unfortunately, I didn't turn ex ex um, No, if you could just stop it and, and view the yeah. estimated. No, I'm going to stop it and go back to the. the oh, okay, yeah smaller table because really <laughs> i mean because i i think it gives an insight as to what inlining actually is or interleaving or inlining inlining, inlining. this is inlining yeah okay, okay actually so, let me show you all right so firstly this is the query for the subquery so you can see my shipment details table you can see my shipments table i've got a merge join and an aggregate um yeah about what you'd expect from this kind of query. Let me go back to 130. <laughs> Whoops, something died. <laughs> All right, so back in 130, if I ran this, it's not going to be too slow. It's now back to the smaller table. Yeah, only three seconds. You can see my index scan on shipments and nothing else. So that entire shipment details query is hidden in Compute Scalar, which has a cost of 3%. I assure you, it's not 
is actually the majority of the work. No, honestly, that's a lovely one to, to note, is if I run the two of them together. Yeah. Um, as far as SQL's concerned, the query that ran sub-second is 97% of the cost of the batch, whereas the one that ran in three seconds is 3% of the batch because it can't see the function. It cannot see into that function. So this is what it looks like without scalar and mining. Now, back to 150. Again. It's yeah. so beautiful. It's complicated. <laughs> it's, done, it's not done a very good job, to be honest. Um, I've got a nested loop join, which I shouldn't have. The tables are the wrong order. This being, neither of them are column store. If you look at the two plans, you can see that this, I mean, this is 20% to 80%, which is roughly about the times they were taking. Um, and the nested because, loop at the bottom is probably why your, your test query ran so long. <laughs> uh, that's actually the one that I ran 25 times and left overnight. Mm. Oh. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's really horrible. <clears throat> it's intentionally horrible. That thing's running, I mean, if I switch this up to the large table, I've got my execution plan turned on now. This is going to take several seconds. This was like 15 seconds, I think. Oh, not too bad. I mean, it returns 34,000 rows, but that's just the number of rows in shipments. Um, you have a hash match now. Um, I also have, look at the estimated row count. Mm -hmm. As you look at the actual row count, that's not even estimated. That is 254 million rows. Um, I did an insert into itself and say, go 10. I went to bed. <laughs> so it doubled itself 10 times. That, that table's huge. Uh, yeah, that, that, that was a hash match anyway, because this is the version without the function. I try this thing with the function and the function. It's, it's ugly. It'll still be ugly. Um, yeah, so we've got a loop join, which is a bit weird. It's gone full on parallel. I've got two aggregations in here. Um, it's definitely not as good a query as the one without the function, but it's way better than the than the actual call out to the function 34,000 times. Um, I mean, it's there's no comparison. So this is good. This is really good. It does not, however, get you the same performance you could if you inline the function yourself, as in turned it from this into this. So I'd still say avoid scalar functions if you can, but if you can't, yeah, this is fantastic. But and this if you is have the, tons and tons of legacy code, upgrade to 2019 might be a really good idea. And compact mode 150. This doesn't right, work right, of course. This does need 150 immediately. Um, vendor code is the other one. The vendor won't fix, can't yeah. fix, doesn't care. Doesn't care. Um, I think doesn't care is the most common one. <laughs> yes, they've got functions. They're not fixing them because reasons. Uh, flip it up to, to take it to 19 if you can. Flip the compact mode up and watch performance improve. Mm. Okay, there are a couple of uh, intelligent query processing things I haven't talked about. Let me find the Microsoft documentation. Intelligent Query Processing in the Microsoft Documentation. Uh, I actually want the top of this, please. <clears throat> so we talked about the adaptive joins. We talked about the interleaved execution, the memory grant feedback in batch mode, row mode in 2019. We talked about table variable deferred compilation. I didn't show you, but it works exactly the same way as the interleaved execution does. It looks the same way. You get the correct number of rows, not the 100 row estimate. Batch mode on row store indexes. This is huge. You no longer need column store indexes to get the batch mode, which can really make queries fast. T SQL scalar UDF inlining we talked about. This one I didn't talk about, the approximate QP and approximate compute count distinct. I don't have enough data to show you this. Actually, I might. Hold on. Um, I cringe a little when I hear approximate. Oh. <laughs> no. It's like it doesn't have no. anything to do with relational databases. <laughs> oh, this is lovely. This is lovely. Uh, uh, 
yeah, the big one. Let's pick the big one. All right, so I want to know how many shipments I've got in this setup, in this query, in this table. How many distinct shipments do I have? I'm almost scared to run that. Okay, so I have 26,760 distinct shipments, and that took four seconds to run. So there's a column store index. This should work. Okay. And it's going to be just as slow. No, three seconds. It is off by 17 rows. It's seriously accurate. Mm -hmm. I don't know how. This is black magic. I mean, <laughs> I understand the query optimizer, but this is black magic. And by the way, this table does not have that much tip mark. It's got 100 million rows on it. This scales I... spectacularly. This is for the 10 billion row table. You can do a count distinct sub second on yeah, 200 billion. I read somewhere that the uh, function uses a known statistical method. I'm not a statistician, not even a mathematician. Black but magic. There, there is a black math, ma black magic sort of statistical. Yeah computation that you can apply. Should be about eight seconds, five seconds, sweet. All right. Okay, you actually read the same amount this time. I think this table is too small to actually yeah. get full on distinct. I mean, it's, a con, so it's not actually that huge. I probably should throw you know, 10 billion, 20 billion in here and see how it handles it. But it really is designed for him. Or it could also be that that was just too... What do I actually have in here that's interesting? There's only one of those in the entire table, because I only have one in the entire database. So <laughs> I need to populate this data table a bit more. Oh, it's correct. Nah, it's still reading the whole, I think it's reading the whole table. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I probably should go uh, and figure this one out, but on the really, really, really large scale, really high end, we're talking, I has column store that is a you know, couple of terabytes in size. This makes a huge difference and it's fairly, it's accurate enough. Yeah. If you need to know the precise number count to stick the table, please. But if you need more or less close enough within, I think they say about 5%. It's it's really accurate. And, and I think it, what it does, it, it skips through uh, pretty much like you build statistics with when you're rebuilding index statistics. It just samples rows. And from Black that magic. sample, you can apply the statistical calculation. Oh, yes. Here we are. 10 billion. Yeah. Oh. I'm I'm definitely on too, too small. I'm like two orders of magnitude too small for this thing to actually make any difference. So, <laughs> yeah. Millions of rows or higher. Yeah, that, there we go. 2% error rate with 97% probability. Um, 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 you. Yeah. Like magic. <laughs> Oh, one other thing to note, uh, scalar UDFs unfortunately have a limitation inline scalar UDFs. As far as I'm aware, it's not in Azure yet. They may have added it recently because I know it's, it says all supported versions. Oh, wow. But if we look at something else, so this one is, yeah. So approximate count distinct applies to 2019 Azure SQL database, Azure Managed Instance Snaps Analytics. Uh, scalar front UDF lining is SQL Server. I don't think it's in Azure yet. I, for some reason it's not. Unless they've done something magical recently, this doesn't apply in Azure. That's strange. All supported versions implies not just 2019 then. But if you look at how it, it's always listed as this. 
Yeah, yeah. this is definitely incorrect. The um, This is very much. This is very wrong, because it doesn't. It does not. It definitely doesn't work in all supported versions. It does not work in 2016, for example, which is a supported mm. version. Um, but yeah, this this page looks a little. Oh, out starting there. with yeah, okay, yeah. It was edited and, two weeks ago, so that was when they released CU5, I think. Yeah, they added some more caveats. I probably should go and fix this. This is definitely wrong. Um, I'm. I'm not 100% sure, but I think this still doesn't work in Azure. Hmm. Oh, yeah, actually, I can see supported in Azure SQL database. So, I if you're using Azure. Hmm? Yeah, I was thinking cloud first. What a disappointment. Cloud first, mostly, but for some reason, this one just doesn't. <laughs> so, if you've got scalar functions and you're, and you're in Azure, inline them yourself. Everything else works fine in Azure. So this also won't work in Synapse, it won't work in managed instance. So all the same thing. Anyway, I diverge. Um, this is going to keep improving. I know they're working on a few other things. So you can expect vNext whenever whatever vNext is. We'll have a bunch more of these intelligent query processing capabilities. We're adding more, and, well, they're adding more and more to solve a lot of the current bad performance problems. Um, I don't unfortunately have anything I can share on that. I don't know what they're actually working on, to be honest. Hmm. So any questions? No Please questions. Um, I can say for myself, I enjoyed this session a lot. Uh, and this is the kind of stuff I I need to to uh, understand to to keep on top of what's happening in SQL Server and to, to give my my stakeholders as a consultant ammunition to upgrade their SQL Server estate uh, because they're inevitably going to say, I just spent millions of bucks on SQL Server 2016. Now, why do I upgrade? Out of support <laughs> works better. Yeah, yeah. So, Big uh, data clusters. <laughs> yeah. no, actually, we have, we have different clients you, clients, you and I. <laughs> no, no, I've got nobody using big data clusters. Nobody even, <laughs> no one's interested. Um, it's one of, to be honest, aren't there many nice features in 19 other than the um, intelligent query process? I don't have a lot of hammers to use on clients. Other than it's out of support, upgrade. Yeah. Still getting people going, I'm upgrading to SQL 2016. Why? It's out of support next year, July, guys. Um, may I suggest something else? Please. <laughs> Thanks. All right, anyway, yeah. I want to get started. Thank you so much for speaking to us. Oh, um, we're, we're, we're very privileged. Actually, this is the one good thing to come out of this entire pandemic thing. Uh, it's not often we have people traveling from, from way, way, way far away, uh, but it makes it easier for us to have great speakers such as you uh, when well, we can video stream them. I said it, um, I put this into my company newsletter the other day, and I thought, we'll be presenting to the Swedish SQL Server user group. <laughs> oh, and comment of, I'm not going to Sweden, I'm just, you know. That's just what I'm doing Tuesday evening. Yeah, that's, that's Tuesday evening. <laughs> um, cool, uh, I think I've got Belgium next month. Nice. Or Manchester, something like that, one of them. One of them. Did, you, did you show off your blog um, to, to the people? It's a SQL I'm, Server in SQL in the wild. SQL Server in the wild. A couple of the posts from there, but yeah, that's the main blog. I have not been writing a whole lot lately, really. Um, I mean, you can tell from. I was going to write a really long rant on my blog. This was many years ago, and I googled. I did my research, and I found an article on. I think it was um, optimizing for table variables. Um, and my blog post was one paragraph where I said, just read Gail's article because it's a lot better than anything I would write about it. <laughs> so. I get back into writing, but it's it's hard lately. Yeah. Anyway, I do need to go. Um, it's eight o'clock here nearly, and I yep. really want to get supper cooked. Thank so you. thank you very much. Have Take a great evening. Bye-bye.